Welcome to the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I really, I really am. You do always say that. I do always say that. <laughs> but in fact, I should get a bloody t-shirt made, shouldn't I? <laughs> Definitely. Because, uh, yeah. But before I introduced, my 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 guest has already spoken, um, so you, you know exactly who it is. No, you won't. Um, people sometimes say to me, what is it that makes your podcast so different, so appealing? And... What I haven't said them to before, but what I should say is that even though there's shed loads of podcasts out there now, um, and I've been in it for a long time, but since then an enormous quantity of competitors have, have, have come into the come into the fray, and you do quite often see the same guests cropping up again and again. And what I think I like to offer is occasionally I will deliver a left field guest, and this week's guest actually. He's going to be. He's going to be so fantastic. I love him. I've, I. I just. Just know he's going to be brilliant. But he. He hasn't been on the other. On any other podcast. I don't think. Have you, Jonathan? No. Okay. No. His name is is Jonathan Miles Lee, and he was two years below me at school. Yeah. Same house. I think. Same house. But we mm. didn't really know. One didn't know the little boys except to sort of bugger them. No, and, I saw and, you and sort them. of <laughs> drifting down a corridor occasionally. Exactly. I, I would. I would have been like a god to you, wouldn't if I? T- t- kind of. Yes. As was your brother. Uh, what, but he, he was in your year, wasn't he? Oh, mm. I see. Yeah, he was the cool kid in the house. But what's quite interesting, what's quite interesting is that um, you found us out because basically I think you're a bit weird like us. Am I? I think, I think you, uh, yeah, come on, don't, don't <laughs> say am I in that kind of, <laughs> really? You are, very, you, are, you are quite eccentric I'm and a, brilliant, by But the I'm way. house trained. You are yeah. totally house trained. <laughs> You are probably one of the most house trained people in in Britain for reasons I'm about to explain. <laughs> so, how would you describe yourself? The, the kind of art that you do? Well, I paint portraits of country houses and gardens, usually from the air, although I don't go up in the air. Um, and they're sort of biographical portraits of people's lives uh, told through the properties they live in. So they will include images of the owners and their cats and dogs and parts of the garden they perhaps planted for a birthday or a wedding. And I've been doing that for 30 years. Did you, so, did you go to art school? No. Oh, no, I'm glad you asked that. (laughs) Very, very interesting. Yeah, I escaped art school. I think if I'd gone to art school, I would have ended up making piles of junk out of broken furniture and writing very pretentious artist statements. You might be richer then. No, right. no, no. My paintings are quite expensive. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> no. That was really important of me to, 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 to suggest that's all right. that you're... I'm glad I brought it up. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's 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 brilliant. So, but yeah, you are, I suppose, a society painter, aren't you? Yes, way. which used to be a term of abuse, but I, I think it's quite a flattering thing to say. You are the no, Rex the, the Whistler to... de nos jours. Well, apparently so. Yeah. yeah, I have been called the successor to Rex Whistler, which is very nice. And um, before that, who who would have been the... the oh, it's, it's a really grand tradition that goes back to the 15th century. So there would be sort of initially Flemish artists that came over and would have rep, uh, sort of done paintings of great country estates in the early 18th century, like Longleat. And there were artists like Jan Sibirex and Kip and Niff who used to visit the country estates around the country and do depictions of them, bird's eye views, really. And that carried on right through up until, what, the 1920s or so? And so I saw myself as somebody sort of trying to reinvigorate this tradition. And I just happened upon the right sort of clients. So people like Sir Roy Strong. I love this. You've got to tell us this. Because this is, this is interesting. So this happened when you were 27. So just before that, what were you doing before you were... Well, I, was, I, I did a history of art and architecture degree at London University because I'd been to visit quite a lot of art schools and I knew I wouldn't fit in. The, the, the look of contempt on their faces as I opened up my portfolio was enough to tell me. Because you could that, draw. Yeah. They said, oh, it's very slick and arty, isn't it? Um, I think what they really were seeing, that I, I, could, I was quite competent as a draftsman, and that's not what they were looking for in places like the Slade or uh, the Ruskin. What did so they want? They wanted people... <laughs> well, I'd look through some of the studios. They would proudly show me around the studios, and I noticed that there was more paint on the floor and the easel than there was on the canvases, and I thought... This is not really the sort of place for me. So I decided to do uh, an academic degree and go and study the history of art and architecture. But that was a revelation to me as well, because when I arrived at university, I discovered that we weren't really being educated about the history of art. It was more a case of 
you know, using this critical theory and pulling the art apart. So I was rather disappointed by that experience as well. Even, even then? Oh, gosh. We're, we're, talk, we're talking, what, 30 years ago? Yes, all that time ago. 1989, I was thinking about this earlier. So I went to London University, and the first, the very first lecture I had was with a man. Can I mention names? Yeah, of course you can. Because I Googled him this morning. I Googled him. Um, uh, Andrew Hemingway, I think it was called. And I thought, something's wrong here. He was talking to us about the great artists, Angra, you know, amazing neoclassical French artist. But in, instead of telling us all the wonderful things about this artist and how his technique was flawless and how his portraits were some of the best that have ever been painted in the history of art, he attacked him um, on the basis that he was sent what we'd call now culturally appropriation, culturally appropriating uh, Eastern themes. So. But what I realized later, he was quoting from a book that was written 10 years before by Edward Said called Orientalism. The terrible book. Yeah. That, that no, no intelligent person <laughs> takes seriously. Well, some did and some didn't. It was a controversial book even when it came out. And I wrote down that it was uh, Bernard Lewis, who was a historian, who called it anti-Western. And I picked up on this, even though I was only, what, 19? I thought, something's wrong. You know, this is, this is uh, harming my appreciation of art. And I, I actually made a a pledge with myself not to attend any more of his lectures, and I didn't. So I, I managed to get through the degree, but I went and got a job at Channel 4 Television instead, and sort of, yeah. That's and a weird <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> it was. What, what well, I wanted what? to be around re real people uh, right. rather, than right. a, rather than academics. Oh, that's a dangerous thing to say. But, uh, you know, I, there was a sense of resentment and uh, a contemptuous attitude directed towards the great history, the canon of Western, Western art. And I didn't like that because I was, I was very lucky, like you. I went to Malvern and my, uh, your, your brother is sitting next to, a, is next to you. We might hear from him soon. Yes. He had the same art teacher as I did. And he was called Bill Denny. Bill Denny. And he would do something really magical. He would take us into the art department and close these black curtains around us and show us slides of great paintings and great architecture and sculpture and frescoes. And he would light that blue touch paper of enthusiasm. And there was something magical happening in those lessons. I'm sure you felt the same thing. Absolutely, yeah. They, yeah. they were very, very um, there were only five or six of us in, in the class for mm. sort of A-level history of art. And I think that on some, some years, of even smaller, but um, very enthusiastic people. Everyone there wanted to be there. And, and Bill was giving you a no-nonsense, mostly a, a tour of the Renaissance, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it was a survey, wasn't it? From the classical period right up until... Maybe not the present day, but, uh, you know, it would talk to us about what was remarkable about a classical temple. Um, you know, it, he was opening our eyes and showing us something that would give us a sense of awe and appreciation of art. Do you know, weirdly, I, <laughs> I am my study mate, whatever they're called, the person who shared your study mate with mm. this guy, guy, guy called Rupert Longmire. And he used to do a an impersonation of Bill Denny's <laughs> um, history of art classes. <laughs> and... The one he used, to, he used to, Hans Holbein was born in 1497. So I've always known ever since that Hans Holbein was born in 1497, which is it's quite useful having these dates to Good hand. Good to know. Yeah, Good in, to know. In, in, yeah. Like I also know from my prep school that the Battle of Blenheim, Ramleys, and Uden, Udenard and Ra Malplaquet were in, uh, well, Brom 4689, four, so 1704, 1706, 1708, 1709. These mnemonics are, are really useful, I yeah. think. They, they, they last you through life. Sorry about that. Thank you for that, James. Yeah. Do you do that little trick when you're at the supermarket and you know, the, the price comes up and it would say 1066 and you'll say, oh, I don't, I yeah, don't, I don't know what happened in 1066. <laughs> oh, Stamford Bridge. <laughs> no. I, 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 I'd do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for the obvious one. <laughs> but no, I was a bit disaffected with, with, with university. So I had far more fun um, playing around at Channel 4, which I would have, I would have paid them to work Doing with. Doing what? Actually. So I was taken on, I was telling Richard earlier, and I, I just walked, walked into reception one day and said, oh, no, I'm Jonathan, could I, have, could I have a job, please? Because I'd love Channel 4 ever since. I remember seeing the first, first broadcast in about 1981, was it? I remember sitting in front of the TV waiting for it to come on. So I thought at, one day. At school? No, um, no, I think it must have been at okay. home. And um, so I thought one day I'd like to work for Channel 4. I'm not sure what I'd like to do. Yeah. But um, so I walked into the reception. I spoke to a girl called Mina on the reception desk. And I said, hello, I'm Jonathan. I, I would like to work here. What can you do? I said, well, I can deliver wine to the uh, boardroom. Or, you know, I can... Uh, 
you know, go and buy photocopy paper. I came up with a few ideas. So the next day I had a phone call from the head of the administration department on the on the phone, what do they call those pho- those pay phones? Old school pay phones. Yeah, which was in the halls of residence yeah. at, at uh, London University. And she said, I'm Barbara Angel. I thought it was nice that she was called an angel. Hey, yeah. And she said, come and talk to me. So the next day, I went to the offices of Channel 4. And she said, I've created a job for you. You're going to be a humper. So I said, what does a humper do? She said, well, I'll give you this little sort of clip-on electronic device. And anybody in the company can just ring it. And it will show a number. You phone that number. And you, you go to their office. And you have to do whatever they want to do. <gasps> so I thought <laughs> this sounded enormous fun. So the, the first time I, I switched it on, a number came up. And as I said to uh, Rich earlier, it was Michael Grade. So he said, come up to the second floor where he had um, a set of uh, uh, coffee cups, which were a little worn. The gold rims around them were a little worn. He said, I wonder if you could help me and go to Heels and buy a new set of coffee cups for me, which I did. And then within about a month, I'd met all the heads of department around the company. And I was, as you say, we're all a bit weird. You know, I was wearing a cravat while I was working at <laughs> Channel 4 and pressed my shirt very neatly in the mornings. Um, I ended up working the press office um, and then as a continuity announcer. So I read the links in between the programs and would say things like, and now a striking adaptation of The Tempest by Derek Jarman on four. (laughs) And I loved this. I loved it. And sometimes I would do it through the night. But it was obviously, you'll know, it's quite difficult to stay awake if you're you're waiting to go live on something, especially if you're in a little dark um, recording suite with foam covered walls so I'd, I'd bring a friend from university with a, a large inflatable hammer and then when it came to my time to make the recording he would sort of hit me on the head to wake me up <laughs> and the four logo would come on you know with all these little pieces little bricks like lego bricks would come on and i would announce then and say and next the news or next roseanne in those days channel four was still had, had yet to become this this creature of the left that it is today yeah it was although eventually they did sack me because i sounded too posh funny that <laughs> how, how, is that how they they expressed it <laughs> more or less i mean I they said, didn't say go. not in so many words you're not one of yeah. us Indeed. but but i mean i had a, a great time there it coincided with something which meant that i wanted to leave london anyway which is connected to channel four but my my boss in the press office took me to the colony room which I don't know if you've heard about it. It was this incredible private club that had been going since the 1950s in Soho. And it was started up by a woman called Muriel Belcher, which is quite good if you're working in a bar. Um, And then she handed it over to Ian Board, her her barman. So when I used to go there, it was Ian Board, who was a very colourful character, used to sit on top of a, um, a stool next to the bar, sipping vodka and orange and would hand out insults to everybody who came in and if you weren't insulted you felt insulted so my boss took me to see an um, an exhibition um, at Birch and Conran it was a small gallery next to the colony room and within 10 minutes he took me up to the colony room because we really wanted a drink that's what you did in the colony room and this was the place where the London School of Artists used to meet like Francis Bacon and um, Lucien Freud Um, and um, Lo and behold, there in that room were some of the most exciting people I felt in London at the time. Um, Maggie Hamling was standing by the piano. George Melly was sitting on a stool in a sort of stripy red suit. And right in the middle of the room was um, Francis Bacon, looking very narrow. I felt that his body looked very narrow with this big sort of shining head. And he had a very tight leather jacket on. And my boss put his fist in the back of my, my back and pushed me into Francis Bacon, so I was about six inches from him. I was all dressed in white like a little angel. I was only 20 years old. And I thought, this is is extraordinary. You know, I'm at university, I'm studying the history of art, but I'm meeting a real artist who had had quite a big impact on me at Malvern. As you know, I used to take blurred photographs that looked a little bit like Francis Bacon's. So my my boss, Ken, said, uh, announced to the room, like throwing a grenade into the, the colony room, this is Jonathan, he's a Christian. (laughs) <laughs> and of course the reaction was to be expected Ian Board exploded that's the uh, the man who, was, who owned the club at the time he said oh no we want no Christians in here get him out get him out disgusting 
Francis Bacon leant forward and got hold of my forearm and said, oh, no, I think it's fascinating if anybody believes in anything. He said, come over here with me. So he took me over to the window seat. He said, now you tell me all about yourself. Um, and um, luckily, George Malley was sitting on a seat nearby. I said, well, at that time, I painted portraits. Um, Francis said to George Melly, do you think he's any good? And George Melly said, yes, he's painted me, actually, which was this strange, uh, strange uh, coincidence because I'd been very interested, as Richard will know, in George Melly because he's such a colourful character. And I used to impersonate him at school. Goodness knows why. It was, a, it was a very, un, <laughs> very unusual thing for... Uh, uh, what, how, how old were you at the time? Uh, as a public 16 school boy, year old. To be even aware of, of, of George Melly, but you were obsessed with him. You, I was. You'd done a fantastic painting of him and you, and you did a, a very good impersonation of yeah. him. I, I have to move to do that. I won't, I'm not going to do it now. But he <laughs> you, sang you like what, Bessie you, what, Smith. What do you mean? What, can't you stand up and do it? Or is no, that, uh, no. Um, I'm trying to think what I did. It's 30 years ago. Uh, he would sing songs like, uh, They Call Me Good Time, George. Who is the rooster? Who is the, who is the hen? Uh, it was all it was all quite fruity sort of um, bawdy songs, and he would but he would wear these secondhand American suits and wear sort of crimson trilbies. He was the most colourful thing I'd ever seen, and also he was very edgy, quite naughty humour. And I found him far more appealing than all the pop stars at the time. Although I did find you introduced me to the acoustic recordings of David Bowie when we were at school, which I thought was pretty amazing. But my my focus really was George Melly. So there was George Melly sitting next to us. Um, Francis said, do you think he can paint? And luckily, George said, yes, he painted my portrait. It was very good, very good. So Francis then took me a little bit more seriously. He said, oh, you must bring some things to show <gasps> me one day. Which I did, of course. I'm not backwards and coming forwards. Oh my God. So uh, the very next day, I went back to the Colin room and um, Francis was, was there. She would tend to go there for a drink in the daytime and then paint at night. Um, and we ended up across the road at um, um, Lescargo, the, the yeah. restaurant. Eleanor Salvoni ran it then. And um, the day went on. It got long, later and later. We had lots of red wine. And I think he, I think he knew what he was doing. I ended up passing out in the bathroom. And then I, I remember hearing this the thumping on the wall. What's, what's going on? And I literally, I'd passed out, locked myself in the bathroom. Should I be telling this story? I'm not yeah, sure. yeah. Just, just anyway, so I was rescued and thrown into a taxi. We'd only gone about half a block when I knocked very politely on the glass screen between the passenger side and the taxi and said, excuse me, could you stop the taxi? And I opened the door and was very sick in the gutter. Unfortunately, right outside Ronnie Scott's, there was a whole row of about 20 people who applauded. <laughs> <laughs> And then my, I, I think I must have passed out at that point and then woke up the next morning um, on the floor in Francis Bacon's studio next to this sort of uh, portable radiator. Um, and there was this sort of uh, dressing gown, red and blue dressing gown, I remember sort of thrown over me. And I could hear this sort of noise. And I thought, what, is it a mouse? Is it a rat? I don't know. Eventually, at my head, my eyes, and I was spinning. Oh, my gosh, I felt so ill. And there was Francis Bacon standing at the easel in front of me, painting, painting. Well, apparently very few people have ever seen him painting. And the significant thing that I remember was that in his left hand, he was holding a postcard of one of his paintings. It had a lot of orange and purple on this postcard. And I said, he said, oh, good morning. And I said, Francis, what are you doing? Because he seemed to be copying the postcard. He said, oh, it's the bloody Marlborough. They want everything to look the same. Meaning the Marlborough Gallery. So, you know, he, he was on a roll doing all of these pictures. And, you know, they quite liked the bright colours in the 80s, late 80s. Um, anyway, so, um, and then he decided to make me some breakfast. So we, I remember we had some baked beans, because I love baked beans. And the funniest thing, I went to see the reconstruction of Francis Bacon Studios in, in the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin about two years ago. And there was the portable radiator. There was the dressing gown on a chair next to the radiator. And there on the floor was an empty baked beans can full of paint brushes. Who knows? It could have been the one that he opened for me when I was having a, a hangover. You know, it was, a, it was a spooky experience because there's a plate of glass on the floor in the Hugh Lane Gallery. You can, when you look down it, you see the staircase, staircase that I sort of pulled myself up. 
every every so often. So yeah, so it was extraordinary. Anyway, I went back to the to to the university and I told one of my tutors, "Oh, I was so full of ex excitement. I met Francis Bacon. I went to his studio. The look of contempt on their faces. They were furious. Why? <laughs> Jealous." Well, I, I, now I realise that must have been what it was. It what, was jealousy. What did they mask it as? I have no idea. I was, I was really crestfallen. And I thought they would just jump on me and this say, tell a, us all about it. This is on your History of Art course? Yeah, absolutely. Right. This was, I think this is the same chap who I've just I've Googled him. And, and apparently he's, he specialises in um, European landscape paintings seen through the eyes of Marxism. Oh, great. So it's critical theory. Just critical theory, absolute yeah. rubbish. Yeah. Just. So, of course, that made me feel even less inclined to attend all the lectures. So I used to just run back to, oh, my gosh, so much more going on at Channel 4 than there was at university. Um, so I had this very rich experience where I was meeting producers and actors and, and uh, you know, having a really good time in London rather than doing what I should have been doing, which is write my essays. So did, did the, 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 the friendship, if that's what it was, continue with... Yes, with for about Francis? 18 months. So that's another significant thing. I wouldn't be a painter if it wasn't for Francis Bacon because I was offered a, a permanent position. I was always um, sort of floating between different departments at Channel 4 and then I was offered a permanent position in the presentation department where I would have been doing links and recordings for the you know, voiceovers. And so I thought, I'm not sure whether I should do it. I'm not quite sure. So I spoke to my boss and I spoke to Francis... Who'd, who was a sort of a shoulder to cry on. He was born the same year as my grandmother, we discovered. So he was quite maternal towards me. And he said, don't do it. He said, television's ephemeral. He said, nobody will remember anything. He said, you are a real artist. And unless you're a painter, you'll never be happy. He said, leave London now. Otherwise, you'll end up like all of us. We were in the colony room. And he pointed around meaning people like... Jeffrey Bernard, Dan Fass and whatever. And they were all rich, colourful characters, but they were all obviously alcoholic yeah. and, you know, rather self-destructive characters. So I did, I followed his advice. I left London and I think within about six months he was dead. He died in Madrid and that was so, but it, it was extraordinary. It was sort of saying, go. And I was, I was devastated he was saying that at the time, but it was obviously... He knew what he was doing. He, in London, it can be a toxic place, especially if you're involved in the arts. You know, it's full of... Um, How fantastic. But you, you, so he passed on the torch, in a way, to you, in an odd well, way. Well, I don't know. Um, but I remember being in awe. I, I used to, <laughs> he would come in. If, I knew he'd done well, and he'd sold a painting, because there'd be champagne bottles lined up on all of the little ledges in the colony room, because he'd just say, champagne for everybody. And everybody had just a bottle. And he used to drink after the... Out of the bottle, I think. I remember seeing him drinking out of a bottle. Um, but he also was very protective. There was one moment. Are you sure you want me to go? Yeah, on yeah I did. This, this is just so, great. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, I was living in Belsize Park in a single room, but it was a lovely sort of grand room with lots of light. And uh, for some reason, the landlord never came to collect the rent. And I thought, well, maybe he's letting me live here free. You know, it <laughs> could be. It happens. You know. yeah. And then one day I came back from, from university or wherever, and there was a note under the door saying, please pay us £4,500. And I was really panicked, you know, I thought, what am I going to do? So the first port of call, rather than phoning my parents or going to university, I went to the colony room, you know, it seemed to be a place of wisdom. And Francis was, luckily, he was there. And I showed him this letter and he said, I'm going to send you to my lawyer in, I think it was in Golden Square, and he'll sort you out. Don't worry, don't worry. So I think the same afternoon, off I went. And this man looked at the piece of paper, put it down. He said, my advice to you is... Do a runner. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, seriously, can I do that? He said, yeah, they'll never find you. So, so, <laughs> so I went back to the colony room and there was Francis, a little more worse for wear. And I said, he told me to do a runner. He said, well, there's only one thing we can do. He said, you're just going to have to come and stay with me for a while. I thought, oh, my gosh. I knew, you know, the, how potent that was. That, you know, I was being invited. But he was friends, was it Michael Edwards or what was his name, his, his partner at the time? He said, he will be very jealous, so we'll have to be very careful about this. Then I went back to Channel 4 and I told my boss, you know, Francis has invited me to go and stay with him. And I was elated. And of course, Ken being very sort of protective said, that's not going to happen. Where's Francis? <laughs> so we got in a cab, went back to the colony room and there was this strange dynamic. I can remember it theatrically laid out, blocked in my mind. Francis in one corner of the room, um, Ken on the other side of the room and me in the middle um, 
and Ken's saying, I know what your plans are. He's not going to come and stay with you. Yes, he is. It's fine. He has got nowhere else to go. Oh, Ken, don't be such an old woman. Blah, 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 blah. Carried on like this. And then Francis said, look, he's got nothing to worry about from me. Um, pointed at me, sort of glanced at me for a moment and said, excuse me. He said, you know, Ken, I like a man to be a real man. Of course, I was deeply offended. You know, I was six foot three. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it didn't happen. All that was put an end to, and I left. And I went to live with a woman called Cornelia Bailey, who some people might have seen on television. Um, she owns this big old Jacobean house in Wales, which is not too clean. It was cleaner when I lived there. Right. <laughs> and it was a way of me avoiding having a proper job. You know, I didn't want to. I wanted to paint. I really wanted to paint. So um, we, we might talk about this. I, I sort of materialize things. I have this sort of magical view on life. I, I visualize things very, very clearly, and then they materialize very quickly. So I imagined living in this house that was full of brocaded velvet and sort of um, ancient curtains. And, and within a couple of weeks, a friend of mine from school said, oh, that sounds like Cornelia. I'm going to see her at the weekend. Do you want to come? So I went with my mother, and she went with her mother. And we entered this sort of extraordinary house full of toucans and cockatoos and parrots that were just flying freely around the house. And um, there was a cockatoo called Grimston that lived on top of the library shelves that used to sort of poo prodigiously down the architectural section. Um, and Cornelia said, why don't you move in? Um, she used to be an, an antiques dealer in the New King's Road, and she'd bought and restored this big Jacobean house. Um, and so within a couple of days, I'd moved in. And I thought I was going to have time to paint. Basically, I was just a house slave who had to feed the numerous, the menagerie, really. Um, and I didn't really get very much time to paint. But eventually she said, why don't you do a painting of the outside of the house? So I, I, that's the painting which is in the kitchen, which you've just seen. Um, and it went really well. It looked as though it had perhaps been painted in 1700. Um, and then um, I just put a little advert in Country Life magazine in 1991. It said, Jonathan Miles Lee, country house painter. My telephone number. And the morning it was printed, it was October 1991, I had five phone calls from people who lived all over the country, Norfolk, North Wales, um, Cornwall. And I just put my only painting in the back of the car and I would go off to these owners of country houses, hold it up on the wall and say, I'll do something like that. And that's how the career started. And I've never stopped for 30 years. There's never been a gap for 30 years. That's fantastic. Now I, you should speak. <laughs> no, I, 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 I feel I'm, I'm redundant in this, in this podcast. Oh I think I'm just going to... Well, I'm going to start a podcast, I think. <laughs> I, think, I think you should. I think you should. I think you should just, just deliver anecdotes about Francis Bacon. I think that, that, that's an enti that could be the next 30 years of your career. But can I just talk about Richard for a moment? Because Richard was the first artist I'd ever met. You see, I was brought up in the northwest of England, and I won a scholarship, art scholarship to go to Malvern. And it was, I felt Richard was so exotic. He wore a trilby and he had these beautiful shirts. And he was painting a triptych, I think, in the art department. When, do you remember what that, what that was? I, I do. It was, we, we, we did things on a grand scale at the art department yeah. at Malvern College. It was a very good art department. It was amazing. That, essentially, it? whatever you wanted to do, they would make it happen. You know, if you wanted to do a, 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 a six foot by four foot canvas or, or bigger they would say well let's get the wood yeah. let's get the canvas let's show you how this is done it, it was beyond what a lot of e even art colleges were, were offering at the time and this was just essentially the um for o levels and a levels yeah uh, but it was it was very advanced and they would if you needed to learn a technique they'd show you and we were in um number nine house nine refer to it as number nine and it, it was the house nearest to the art center and it had um the, the largest number of um, musicians, artists, cross-country runners, and heavy metal fans. Yeah, it was uh, amazing. It, it was, um, Real world has uh, been so it, disappointing since. Our, our house was, was particularly exotic and, and, and full of weirdos. Yeah. And, and it was a house that, that you and I were both in, obviously. With a laissez-faire housemaster. With a very laissez-faire <laughs> housemaster. We used Nigel to brew Stewart, beer under, under, a, a wonderful chap. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the, the art department was a hop, skip and a jump across a, a field. And we wouldn't just go there for lessons. We'd go there in all our spare time. It was open at all, all hours. You could yes. go in and just pick up your project where you left off. And, and the wonderful Dave Bennett, who is still a 
big big friend of mine lives in lives in Worcester I, I see him regularly he would be the, the the arts assistant and he would be there to make sure you want to do a screen print we'll get it all mm. set up and we'll do this together it was a wonderful wonderful time to be uh, a, a young artist yeah it was such a blessing blessing to be there and in a very beautiful environment as well the schools nestled against the Malvern Hills and the grounds are full of cedar trees it's, it's an exquisite place I mean f- physically it was an inspiring place to be wasn't it yeah and and, and some really talented people around there who, who were, were, were given free reign to to, to experiment uh, which almost it was a, a step down by the time one got to art college because mm-hmm. it was never quite as good as as Malvern. Well, that's what I felt. I felt that the university education I had was less uplifting than the one that I had at Malvern. I remember yeah. going with um, another of our friends from our house, Adam Norton, who was another regular at the art school. Adam got a place at the Ruskin in Oxford. Oh, yeah. So he went up the same year as me. And I remember going to the degree show and I remember thinking, this is absolute cack. This is this is nowhere near as good. It wasn't. It was nowhere near as good as as the Malvern College no. art art studio. I mean, you know, and and, and the, the, these were sixteen year olds, not yeah. not undergraduates doing this this stuff. Can you remember what the artwork looked like? Was it made out of sort of foam or something? I tell you what, I remember vividly. I remember that the exegesis of the the the, the, the sort of the, the the screed next door to the to the artwork whatever it was was more elaborate than the oh, actual gosh, artwork yeah, absolutely so, all of those pretentious artists they had to tell you what it was yeah because otherwise you'd have thought this is shit well it's all about the idea and i think i've worked out what's going on because you've got hundreds of people you, uh, who want to study art and obviously you want their payments their, yeah. their, their uh, payments for the what do you call it the uh, the, the arts funding paying for Dame the guilt. guilt yeah um it only takes five minutes to say uh, make a happening, you know, uh, buy a lot of food and watch it rot. It only takes five minutes to explain that that's what they should do as an artist, whereas it takes years and years and years to show them technique, how to paint and draw, which everybody needs, no matter what sort of artist they're going to be, in order to move away from, don't they? They need a grounding in something. But craft is is, is now completely frowned upon across the board, isn't it? Mm, not so much. Actually, things are really changing. Oh, are they? Yeah. Tell me. Um, I don't know so much about England. But I've spent a lot of time in Italy. So the Florence Academy of Art, I, I have friends there who teach, and they're using the site size method, and um, they have life drawing classes every day. Um, and that's that's being picked up in America as well. They've, they've always taught figurative art. What's the, in, what's the size method? Sight size is where you place either the subject of a portrait next to at the same plane as the canvas. So you're looking, you're painting the same size, you know, the, oh, the subject, okay. or the same with still life. Um, I I generally don't paint from life. I paint from my drawings. But um, but that was, you know, they're basically teaching the traditional craft techniques, how to use your paints and how to look after your studio rather than throwing the paint all over the place and having more on your clothes than on the so this is this is the, the, the backlash there is a, there is mm, the oh, re- there's definitely a reaction to it yeah also i think because education has become so expensive parents have you know they're checking out the courses they want to get something for the money so you know it's more important for them to send their child somewhere where they can see that they've at least mastered um, you know a craft or a, a skill in a particular area and florence academy of art has an amazing sculpture department as well with casts. It's the first time I've seen you know, the casts being used, casts of classical sculptures and busts. Um, and for the first year, I think students there just do tonal studies in charcoal or paint from busts. So they're, they're mastering how light and shade falls upon an object. So whereas the British art schools, I think they're really driving them to create conceptual art right from the beginning. And so I've spoken to many people who studied art and architecture in Britain who say their the course began at the Bauhaus or they began at, a, at, a, at a sort of abstract expressionism. And they haven't had exposure even to earlier artists or earlier architecture, which is kind of sensationally bad, isn't it? So they, they began with the explosion that destroyed everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the reaction against rubble. all of the traditional art, yeah. So are there any... You, you say Florence has got it right, and, and parts of America have got it. Is, are there any names in America that you can think of? Or? I can't, to no. be honest. But no. in, in Britain... They're usually small private galleries, or uh, private art schools, or liberal arts colleges will run really good traditional art tuition. Right. 
Um, but there are few and far between. I'm sure people will contact you and say where they all are. You can find these places. I wish I'd known when I was looking for an art school about Cecil Art Studios, for instance, in Florence, because there are a lot of people who've been trained in portraiture there. And, you know, they're given a really amazing grounding in technique. But I went, I went to the Ruskin and the Slade and the Royal College, and I had interviews at all of them, and it was sort of mu- mutual dislike, really. I well, dislike. Thank goodness. <laughs> exactly. I think I had a narrow escape. Yeah, it would have been. Now, I, we were talking earlier about my experience at Cheltenham Art mm. College, which I think was what, three years from 89 to, ni- no, 88 to 91, and then I went on to do an MA at Belfast. But... We did have some good craft um, lessons, as in learning about the use of paint, learning how to mix mediums, learning how print to stretch making. a canvas properly, mm. uh, um, doing print, a bit bit of sculpture, that sort of stuff. And I seem to have got off lightly because that mm. that was when the rot was setting in. Mm. But there was this underlying thing of postmodernism, and you were taught you are whether you like it or not you are a postmodernist painter this is what you do you mix up the styles reject the old um you know it, the, so they were sort of forcing the ideology, ideology onto you then well didn't you, you say that somebody told you to go and read derrida yeah <laughs> um I, I was encouraged to do so i never did out of pure laziness and i, I i'm i'm glad i didn't but yeah. there, there was this thing going on this is cheltenham the rural pleasant cheltenham but as you said at the same time in london yeah I, i'd have been in, in you know in a, in you, a pit of hell in comparison yeah you wouldn't have had that broad experience i don't think um i was just thinking how lucky i was to come across writers like roger scruton later in life because um as soon as i read but well, the first book i read by him was um england and elegy which i think is a masterpiece um, his books on architecture and music are, are pretty um, difficult. They're a little bit impenetrable. They're very academic, aren't they? But I, I think most people have seen that uh, TV broadcast he made uh, called uh, Why Beauty Matters. And when you mention Roger Scruton to most people, that's that's the thing that they mention rather than the books because it, it reached so many people. And he said that if you'd asked anybody between 1730 and 1930, um, what the purpose of art was they would have said beauty and if you ask them what was the purpose of beauty they say that it was um it it was a value like truth and goodness and that struck home to me um and i thought this ties back to francis bacon a little bit The, the second question i remember ever asking him i think for some reason i asked him when he was born second question was what what are you interested in and he said i'm interested in evil And my boss, who was sort of hovering behind us, said, well, Francis, that's not very nice. And I said, well, I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I am. And and I think it's because he'd lived through two world wars. And he wasn't obsessed by evil. He was confused why people can become evil, which in a way is um, the same preoccupation that Roger Scruton had. You know, um, the truth, goodness and beauty is something which all societies, all civilizations have striven for over millennia. But there seems to be this virus that's come, that comes in every so often, which we probably would identify as communism or um, Marxism, which, seem, which wants to undermine that. Or cultural relativism, I suppose. Crit- yeah. Critical theory is its modern form, yeah. isn't it? Which is more dangerous than this, the name would imply. Um, so even though I'm a painter... I take a great deal of interest in cultural what's happening culturally, and I'm reading at the moment uh, cynical theories by Helen Pluckrose and Andrew uh, Andrew Lindsay. Yeah, um, and I think it's important to know the direction of of, of the society. The, the society seems to be going into a dire- in, in the direction of pulling apart all of tradition, dismissing it. Uh, finding reasons to label it as um, patriarchal or colonial, and and that and that's a source of enormous sadness to me because everything that I've jo- enjoyed throughout my entire life, whether it's public sculptures in London or history paintings, is being dismissed. And I'm wondering what we're going to be left with, because if you read people like Saul Alinsky, who says the end justifies the means, in his book, um, what's it called? Um, 
What, Rules for Radicals? Rules for Radicals, yeah. I just read it recently. Which he dedicated to Satan, I think. Said he did. Can you believe yeah. it? I mean, the, the techniques he used in it were pretty revolting. He seemed to be obsessed with rather rather nasty well, it's, techniques. It's, it's funny you say that. that I, I hear this more and more. People, I mean, you're, a, you're religious. People do talk about what's going on in the world at the moment mm, in terms of spiritual aspect evil. to it. Yeah. Mm. There, is, there is something satanic, isn't there, about the... About I'm afraid there theory. is. Yeah, I mean... I feel as though you can almost taste it, and I, I think if if you're very grounded and you're, um, you you can you can tell when somebody's telling the truth. We were talking about this earlier. Even if, if you're watching a politician, Richard said you need to be in their presence. But I think still on television as well, you can feel truth with your whole body. You 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 can sense when somebody's coming from a place of truth, and but also you can tell if you're sensitive. You can tell when somebody's coming from a place of darkness, and they often use obfuscation which is what all of these postmodernist um, academics use you know they'll use the most convoluted gobbledygook uh, in order to distract you from what their real purpose is which is the pulling apart the disintegrating of of the western tradition or whatever it is that's in their sights at the time interesting that you you were talking about beauty which you you could argue that beauty is a manifestation of the divine yes yeah so you can see why. Mm, oh, yes. It, it's something that provokes awe in people who uh, love the truth, but also a sense of disgust in people who don't. So I remember being told um, by an Irish academic that beauty, beauty was fascist. So they'd been indoctrinated at university with this idea that anything which was attractive or symmetrical or harmonious was fascist. And so uh, that's a terrible... That, that's I think that's like a virus that's that's got into their system that's that's like a circuit breaker it's it, it's it's a, affecting the way they relate to the world and and it, it, sort of inhibiting them from feeling happiness I think we need we need beauty don't we well we do and I wonder whether that people who've studied the rise and fall of civilizations mm. say that in the final stages in, in the mm -hmm. death throes of a civilization they turn towards decadence. Mm. They, they reject. They reject things like beauty in in, in favor of, the, of yeah. the darker things. Well, that's. I've just been rereading Oswald Spengler's book, The Decline of Civilizations. Well, it's a big book. <laughs> I should have brought the uh, the uh, the abridged version, but it's also something that Camille Paglia is really articulate in talking about. She was talking to Jordan Peterson, and she said at the end stages of civilization, some really weird things manifest. One is an obsession with celebrity chefs. <laughs> which happened at the end of the Roman Empire and what's happening today. Marcus Apicius, was he... Was he a, uh, Who was that? Was he, good, he, was was a good, a, he had some good Glirais recipes. Did he? Yeah. Cook up a... a <laughs> Glirais are dormice. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And what was the other thing? Yes, and also um, a drifting towards androgyny and the, you know, the, the, the mixed, mixing up of the sexes. That no wonder we're aspect. so buggered because we three are such... Um, studs, st such studs. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I do think it's it's important to be physically fit. I mean, you, Richard, you went swimming this morning, didn't you? You went shooting. I so. did. I did my intervals this morning as well. What were those? Well, I, there's a, there's a track I run up and down. Oh wow! Which actually is, I, I think, probably better. I I do long longer runs. You know, there's mm. a five miler I do, but actually, I think in terms of pure fitness you are better off doing sprints and then walking back sprints and then walking back sprints then walking back yeah i think because it, it's that what's it called um uh hit isn't it high high intensity uh, is training it exhaustion no we're all no. over 50 aren't we we are yeah you, 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 we are no, I, 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 <laughs> fighting off various uh, ailments as well so you know oh my god dick I, this is it's so sad isn't it we are we we all we've all acquired I, well you have as well you've got you've got yeah i'm a miracle survivor Actually, before we go on to that, I just want to say briefly, because I, I, should, I should do this in all my podcasts, and I learned this from Ivor Cummings. Um, mm. You're listening to The Delling Pod, and I really hope that you are able to support me on Patreon or Subscribestar, because um, I'd like to really develop this side of my of Yeah, my I'd career. like to help you with I, that. I, I think it'd be... Uh, look, the more support I get, the more, I can, the more of this stuff I can do. And I do think that actually, probably I am one of the better people at, at this. You're the best. So, oh, thank you. Or oh, oh, shucks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want a mug with your face on it. Oh well, well, yeah, well uh, maybe we can develop our merchandising rate, rate yeah. more. And once Dick gets better at promotion, he's good. At, this is the thing. 
Dick is really, really good. This is true, isn't it, Dick? You are absolutely brilliant at the conception and the designing stuff. And you're you're even quite organised. But like me, you're not so good at the the promo. uh, Yeah, considering I've worked most of my life in advertising and marketing, I... It, it, I know what I have to do, but the, there's something that I, I can't bring myself to complete. It's uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm crap at it, but uh, it's I, all I, coming I together. Do a lot better. It is coming together, and I, I, I know what has to be done. But uh, sometimes well, I'd just rather play online tank games than uh, than design a new T-shirt. <laughs> That's the thing. We're all about the es- we're all about the escape. The, the, actually, this reminds me of something that the boy said to me the other day when we were we went we went shooting. Oh, yeah. And there's a bit at the end where you you tip your your loader uh, and the gamekeeper. You as tip well. your loader. You, you? you tip loader and the, and, and the gamekeeper, <laughs> and and you, you do it by you sort of shake their hands and you sort of put the money in the palm of your hand. And boy said to me that it's really weird, isn't it? It's a reflection of our attitude to money in this country that we think it's somehow dirty and, and, and something secretive. I mean, you should be perfectly reasonable to <laughs> reward somebody for his services, but no, we have to do it in this slightly embarrassed way. And I think maybe that's our problem, that maybe we're too English. Yeah, I'm a, v- a real evangelist for... I mean, I think... And if you look at artists in the past, they were business people as well. You think of um, uh, Rubens. He, w- he was a, a cultural ambassador for the Netherlands, and he came to Britain, and at the same time as meeting, I think, would it have been Charles I, he he managed to get a commission to paint the ceilings of the banqueting house. So there's there's no reason why being commercial cannot be connected with being um, uh, creative. And I, I've lived for four years in America. I lived a year in New York, and I lived four, uh, three years in Los Angeles. And there, there's no sense of guilt of associating creativity and profitable, profitability. And people are more likely to ask you, you know, where are your houses if you're an artist in England? Whereas in England, if you explain you're an artist, they usually say, oh, you poor thing, can you pay the bills? There's a, there's a big difference uh, culturally in how creativity is regarded in, in the new world, I would say it's the same in Australia and Canada and, and America. To in Britain, Britain, we feel as though we should be very modest and, you know, it's almost a badge of honour to live an impoverished artist's life. I was quite surprised when you mentioned earlier on, um, before we, we started recording this, how happy you'd been in L.A. And, and how nice the people were, which isn't what one generally hears about L.A., so how come you had that experience? No, well, most people hear about America from the television, don't they, I suppose? Um, but I think if you go and live there, you see what the country's really like. And it's, a, it's an amazing place of vast landscapes. I was very lucky because I traveled all over the country, Illinois, Texas, ev- everywhere. I drove down both coasts and right across the middle. Were you doing commissions? Um, on yeah, on and off, yes. I went to America because... Well, originally I went to New York. I forget the reason. Oh, it was Oprah Winfrey wanted me to painting of a house in um, Montecito, California. You just, yeah, <laughs> you don't know she's just, she, yeah, she was very nice to me. Well, I met her with David Lindley in London, who'd been supplying her with furniture. So he phoned me. I was living in Brussels. That's Lord Lindley. Yeah. Lord, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was living in Brussels at the time, painting for the Queen of Belgium, Queen of the Belgians, I think she's called, doing the Royal Palace, Palais Royal. And David phoned me and said, "Look, I've got a really amazing client." Um, uh, this uh, this woman who would like a painting of the house. So I thought, it's the Queen, isn't it? <laughs> but it wasn't. So that, he said, the Queen I can't. Is his aunt, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So I thought, well, uh, he said, bring lots of lots of drawings over. Bring them over to London. We're going to have dinner with her on this particular day in in a restaurant across the road from the store in Pimlico Road. And so I, I still didn't know until the, the the day I got there. And um, he said, well, I'll tell you now. It, it's it's Oprah Winfrey. I said, oh my goodness, that's amazing. I'd sort of guessed something was happening because there were enormous bodyguards all around the shop. So we went and had dinner together. I think there were just six of us. Uh, there was David Furnish, Elton John's partner. There was Andre Walker, her dresser, and Anthony Brown, her interior designer. And we got really drunk um, because we had a very light starter. It was asparagus. Uh, no, it was artichoke, which there's not a lot of food on an artichoke is that we were drinking quite a lot of champagne so by the main course we were pretty gone and um so this thing that people do in america they'll go around the table and say okay five people for dinner who would you invite or was it six um i forget how many people were dinner she says so we went around the table and she said to me uh, you know so who would you invite for dinner i said it's easy charlie's angels and the jackson five and she's i like that 
And at the end of the dinner, she got hold of my hands and looked into my eyes and said, we're going to see you in California very soon. So I thought, I made it. I made it. It's fantastic. So, um, so yeah, I painted this house in Montecito from the air. And uh, so that was why I went to New York. Sorry, digression. Right. So that was the first time I went to America. I just stayed for a year. Then um, I, whilst there, I painted Evelyn, Evelyn Lauder, who was the, um, the, um, the wife of Leonard Lauder, who was Estee Lauder's son. So daughter-in-law to Estee Lauder. I painted her portrait because my partner at the time worked for Estee Lauder. And then um, many years later, uh, the family got in touch with me and said, would I like to paint the rest of the family? which was wonderful because the Lauders are major art collectors and they've established museums like the, the Neu Gallery in Fifth Avenue. So um, I used this as the opportunity to, to apply for a three-year visa and I got it immediately. In fact, the, the, the immigration attorney in Montecito, in um, Encino, California, said, I'll even write into your contract that if you don't get this visa, I'll give you the money back, which he did. Yeah, so I only paid something like $3,000. And she made this enormous document, and I thought it was very amusing. One of the pages was a w the Wikipedia page from the Queen she put in there. I said, is that really necessary? She says, oh, they'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, because I painted the Queen, that Richard said I should mention this. Well, I think people find it quite interesting that you, yeah, you I've painted been, the Queen. You see, I've hidden my light under a bushel for such yeah. a long time. Yeah. <laughs> People, people, that listen, bushel's got people so big. listen to this podcast thinking, okay, so I, I been busy. hadn't heard this guy, and I suddenly realized he's about the most famous person I didn't know no, about. No, I've been hidden, you see, because I'm, I'm a traditionalist painter. I don't, you know, no journalist would want to write about me. That's I'm, true. Because I'm not. I, I, I care. I Do care, you? John. Thank oh, you. I love you. I know. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> and you're so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I was I was at uh, Burley House, which is a big sort of Elizabeth, uh, Jacobean Elizabethan house in uh, Stamford, and I was doing a series of paintings there. And Victoria Leatham said to me over breakfast one morning, "Jonathan, do you know any, anyone who paints portraits?" And I said, mm, "Not really, not really." She said, "Well, the thing is, I'm looking for somebody to paint the Queen," and I said, "Oh, what a shame," <laughs> because I'm really a bit naive and a bit slow on the uptake sometimes. So. I was in the car on the way back home. I was living in, Sus in Sussex at the time. And I suddenly thought, oh, my God, <laughs> did I miss something really major here? Phoned her on my sort of rubber Nokia and said, uh, Lady Victoria, when you were asking me, did, you, did I know anybody who would paint the Queen? Did you, did you mean me? And she said, yes, dear, I did. I said, well, I'll have a go. I'll have a go. <laughs> so this meeting was set up at uh, St. James's Palace. For some reason, the sitting was to take place there. And her equerry or uh, staff got in touch and said, you know, what would you like the Queen to wear? And I said, oh, the garter robes, they're so fabulous, you know. And it was for the, the Drapers Hall, which is one of the livery country, companies in London. And it was the 500th anniversary of the land being given to the Drapers Hall by Henry VIII. So what they wanted was a painting for the entrance hall that would echo the painting. I think it's a Holbein or after Holbein of Henry VIII. So a flanking picture of the present Queen. That's why it looks the way it does. I yes. thought it was quite Holbein-esque. Yes, it was consciously like that. Yeah, right. With, with a drape of green fabric in the background, yes. And she's seen in profile. Should, should we tell our, our special friend how to go about seeing these things? Because uh, Jonathan's obviously got a, a marvellous website. And uh, I think really... Uh, oh, thank you, should, should be actually looking these up while he's listening. Oh, you can have a look, yeah. Um, it's Z, I think, Z. because obviously, as we know, that the special friend has many avatars, some male, some female, some gender neutral. Quite. But, uh, You're talking about me. Jonathan, <laughs> the, 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 um, what is the... Uh, My website, are, it's www.miles, with a Y, M-Y-L-E-S hyphen L-E-A dot com. So that's miles hyphen Lee. But... I also, I'm a, I've a, I'm a fiend on Instagram. There's a tsunami of posts that I issue into the world every day, and I've got 25,000 followers on there. And that's Miles Lee, M-Y-L-E-S-L-E-A, M-Y-L-E-S-L-E-A. And I say, it's quite an educational profile, but it's also a little bit provocative. Um, I talk about issues like education and beauty, and, and it's a little bit, little bit fruity sometimes. This sound, uh, it sounds good. I mean, I don't even use Instagram, but I'm I'm now thinking of updating. Oh, you my, must you must Instagram join just, just to follow just, me, just to follow It'll you, to keep you busy, honestly. And when I joined Instagram and I started posting all these things, it's it's led to amazing opportunities, including the invitation to to lecture at Harvard, 
So out of the blue, one morning I woke up, there's an email from a woman called Lisa Hughes, who, Hughes, who's the admissions officer at Harvard Business School. She said, would you please come and lecture? Could you give us a lecture? And I said, what about? And she said, anything you like. <laughs> So I put together a lecture called The Power of Beauty and the Inflection Point to give it a sort of business twist. And um, so I, I, I basically put in a lot of quotes by Jordan Peterson and Roger Scruton just to see, you know, how much I could get away yeah. with. And, uh, you know, they pretended not to have heard of him, which is, which is impossible. But I, I basically bombarded them with beauty for an hour and However, and how did it get on? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, I've never had this experience in a British uh, university when I've given a lecture, but all of the attendees came and shook my hand afterwards and wanted my, um, my signature, my autograph, which was really bizarre. But apparently everybody around the campus on the other, who was studying other courses heard about this lecture. I had some of them in tears, apparently. Um, I mean, well, did, you try and, did you enter their safe spaces? And, and <laughs> no, no. But it was a bit like being fed to the lions. So it was like a meeting of the UN. It's a sort of horseshoe, beautifully sort of uh, crafted wooden lecture hall with three screens and a laser pointer. And it was being filmed by these sort of robot cameras that were swiveling around in, in the walls. And um, uh, But it went really well. I was absolutely terrified when I was taken down to the room because it, it is. they were all mid-career executives. They weren't undergraduates. They were people who were paying, I think it was £48,000 for a summer course. And there were 13 lectures, and I was the only person who wasn't an indentured professor. You know, and I said, does it, does it matter? And they said, no, you're a good communicator. You'll be fine. But, of course, I was really you must have, But you must have prepared. Oh, quite, my gosh, quite. three months. I mean, I didn't do any painting. I literally, I was writing it. I was reading it out to friends in England. I was preparing it, you know, very, very carefully. I'd got high-res images from the Ruskin um, Library up in Lancaster. So I wanted all the images to be perfect. Um, it was choreographed. So, And also I watched lots of um, YouTube videos and TED Talks about how to give lectures. Ted, Ted's kind of evil, isn't it? Well, it's a little bit simplified, isn't it? But it was, one of the things I picked up from it was if you're giving a lecture, you have to take, get, make people feel all the emotions. So you can make them laugh, you, you know, make them feel contemplative and make them cry. And I did it all in, 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 uh, in the lecture. So, um, so that was, that's all through Instagram. So I'm, a, I'm an evangelist for Instagram. Did you get any... Uh, first of all, I hope they paid you for this. Oh my gosh, yes. Oh, yeah. They, and, yeah. They paid me to go over to Boston for, I think, a week. And the food was amazing. And yeah, and they paid me about, I think it was about 3,000 for the lecture, which you'd never get in England. Okay, but presumably you got some work as a result of that as well. Um, mm. I can't think of anything directly, but a lot of the students, or the, you know, they were between 35 and 55. A lot of them follow me on Instagram. And... Um, and, you know, and, and send me things now and again. I don't think it's directly le led to any commissions. Do you think, uh, do you think before we go on, we ought to have a cup of tea? Yes, definitely. I think we should. So I'm going to put it on pause. Mm -hmm. And and then th nobody will know that we've had a cup of tea. No. So it'll just be blum. But our mouths will sound more lubricated. I think they will, yeah. <laughs> That's a word that I think I think my wife hates me using, <laughs> lubricated and moist, uh, uh, her <laughs> least favourite word. I can't think why. Um you can't even say a cake is moist, you know. Mm, that cake's lovely and moist. No, I hate that word. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> right. Okay. Literally, nobody knows that we've got some cups of tea now, and we're going to. Well, we're everybody gonna hear, knows. They'll hear the slurping noises, and and that will be a clue. And also, uh, as you say, I lubricated. Yeah. I Do lubricated you like the spode? Tonsils. Spode Italian. That. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, mine Very has fancy. mine has the number fifty written on both sides, which I was a little embarrassed about when I was given it to, for my birthday. But now you were, only, you were only thirty at the time. Well, you? no, I was no, <laughs> I was fifty, but now I'm nearly fifty-two. So I'm going to keep this. I'm going to use it ostentatiously. I think you're going to be fifty forever now, Jonathan. I think it, it I will. would be it would be very sad. <laughs> um, I loved the story you told about and this because you're you're quite a sort of. You're an odd mixture of, of, of modest and charming. I'm quite diverse, aren't I? You're quite, you are mm. diverse. Yeah. I'd give you a job if I were looking for, a, if I were the diversity department. Of, yes. But I'm not sure whether that definition of diversity would necessarily get you a job in most companies. It would, because I have a, a sub-personality with our own Instagram account called Dame Jenny Fulborough. Yeah. Did um, you not know about that? No, no, no. She's no. very popular. Have you not seen her? Yeah, she's called Dame Jenny Fulborough, and she, she came into my life in 1997. But she's quite elderly now. She's the uh, president of the International Macrami Foundation. Yeah. And you, so you, this well, is she's your, my this is your PA. alter, 
She's my yeah, yeah. If I'm having a problem with a client, it's all I've blown it now. I, a, a letter would be written by Dame Jenny Fulbright. So, for instance, Timothy Mole, who, used, uh, who wrote, writes books on architecture, there's one there, the, architect, the architecture of John Wood. He used one of my paintings on the back of a book uh, without asking permission. So I thought, well, I can't write to you. It seems a bit sort of rude. So I, Dame Jenny wrote and said, Oh, Jonathan's rather upset that you use one of his pictures on the back of your book and you haven't mentioned it to him. And so he wrote back. He said, oh, well, if you send me £25, I'll send you a copy of the book. And <laughs> and so Dame Jenny wrote back. She said, oh, he's not feeling very well at the moment. I wonder if you could just pop one on the post. And uh, one of my other clients said to me the other day, she said, oh, um, Timothy Mole was here the other day. And he said that, you know, he'd received rather a frosty letter from this la- lady, da- Dame Jenny Fulbright. And she seemed quite elderly and was quite bossy. So, yeah. She she sounds. <laughs> I'd like her as my. Pick. Shall I tell you what why she exists? Uh, <laughs> Are you remotely interested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course I am. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is when, when I was living in Battle in East Sussex, in um, the mid nineties, um, my partner at the time, Edward, 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 uh, used to work across the road at Battle Abbey selling tickets, and um, and I would phone him at, at 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 work and say, would you know, can you bring some milk home? And um, he would come back with the milk and say, please don't phone me at work. It's so embarrassing. You know, nobody knows that we live together. So I started phoning up initially as Barty. I say, hello, is Edward there? <laughs> Isn't he a lovely young man? I said, can you ask him to bring some corn plasters and in- a nimble loaf when he comes back? Because he passes the end of my garden. And so he would bring back. He said, there's your nimble loaf. Uh, I did this a few times and eventually he just said, he put his hands together in prayer and said, please, please, can you can you ask Barty never to phone again? It's so embarrassing. I can't bear it. So I said, ha, you know, hand on heart, I would never, Barty would never phone again. Mm-hmm. But Jenny Fulbright started phoning, <laughs> usually after a few sherries. And she said, hello, is Edward, is Edward there? He's a lovely young man, lovely green eyes. Um, <laughs> I'd love to speak to him, but can you get him a message? Uh, can you ask him to bring the observer back? <laughs> lovely thing, go by. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, there was one there was one guy who worked there called Graham who was so polite he would never put the phone down on a member of the public. Yeah. So it was a captive audience. And I'd say, oh, hello, Graham. Why don't we go on a picnic sometime? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, well, Jenny, I, I do have a lady friend. She said, oh, no, I would brook no competition. What's her name? Um, and this one honestly went on for months. And I used to look at the rotor. Uh, it was English Heritage that ran Battle Abbey. And there was a one-man site called Bayham Abbey. So I would work out when Graham went to Bayham Abbey. And I'd phone specifically on that day. So I'd say, hello, Graham. Do you like kiwi? <laughs> Shall we have a picnic? And he'd say, he would be so polite. He couldn't say, look, stop phoning, Jenny. It's not... It's not suitable. He would just say, well, um, I don't know. Ooh, I'm not sure. Um, so um, he actually, the way of getting around was by asking a woman called Annabelle to go and uh, go and man the site with him so he would be less intimidated. Um, and I'd still phone up and he would ask Annabelle to answer the phone. So she'd say, hello, Bear Mabby. I'd say, who's that? Are you his fancy woman? <laughs> <laughs> She'd say, if you phone again, we're going to have to call the police. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, boys in blue, not necessary at all. Absolutely not. No, no, no. So once, apparently they were arriving at the site early in the morning, they went to the local spa shop on the corner and they saw this old elderly lady ruffling, rustling through the carrots. And they, she shot them a sort of dirty, dirty look and then ran out of the shop. And they said, that's her. That's Jenny Fulbright. <laughs> so they believed that she really existed. And then the door opened and the little bell rang above the door. <laughs> and the local vicar came in and they said, Vicar, does the name Jenny Fulbright ring any bells? And he said, it does sound familiar. Let's go and check the church records. <laughs> Can you believe it? There was a woman called Jenny Fulbright. No. Yeah, yeah. No. Because I made up the name when I was looking at the Battle and Rye Observer. You know, when somebody said, oh, Jenny, yes, what's your surname? And it was, it was an article about Pulbra. So I said, oh, it's Jenny Fulbright. <laughs> But that is weird. You see, this is where your your weird mystical psychic side must. Do you not come think from. it's normal? I, I don't think it's normal to invent somebody and then, then have them come. Oh no, to she's my... real. I'm just channeling her. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So she has her own Instagram account, and she has her own. Uh, she did have her own Facebook for uh, for a while, but she's certainly on Hotmail. And if I do need to send a little reminder about a deposit, you know, it's Jenny who writes. Well, let's just hope that nobody listening. 
to this gets. I think they'll find it amusing. I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not that. I just, I just don't want to blow your your roots, my cover, your, your, your technique. Yes. Well, uh, well, I just get Piers McLeod to phone instead. <laughs> This is a bit fruity. Hello, Jill. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> a lovely old Jenny. <laughs> Fabulous bottom. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so Piers McLeod, he's existed since about the same time. I used to phone my boss and say, Hello, it's Piers here. Just back from fishing. <laughs> it's Ken in the office. You know, so uh, that was my way of, of asking Ken if he wanted to go for a drink down the road in Soho <laughs> after work. I don't know how we got onto this. Well, uh, we were talking about. I was just, I was leading up gently, and uh, this is was a massive digression. <laughs> I was. Get, I'm going to ask you straight, so we don't have any more digressions. Tell me the story about how you. Tell me about Roy Strong. About how you. I will if you give me one of your bad badges. Yeah, you, of course you can. <laughs> have you I got want a badge here? A special friend well, badge. You, I've you, been lusting after yeah, it on the website. Unlike, so. unlike that bitch. <gasps> Douglas Murray. Well, don't call him that. No, but you know, you, you, th- that moment. <laughs> well, I'll have his as well. I'll have two. I can wear them on. <laughs> Do you know Did what? You? No, I tell you what, I tell you what happened about that. Somebody, somebody offered to buy Douglas Murray's rejected badge. <laughs> and I had, I communicated with him on, on Twitter about this. Um, but unfortunately, I then didn't follow through. Oh, no. He was going to pay me a decent amount of money for it. And because I'm so crap, I just forgot his name. And that was a great opportunity. Because even Lawrence Fox didn't tell you how much they cost. So you could, we could put these on eBay and keep outbidding other people. I, I'm, I'm thinking of having the equivalent of a, a Ritterkreutz version of the special film I don't, badge. I don't speak Swiss. R- the, Ritter, the, the Ritterkreutz is like the Iron Cross with Oak's leaves, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the ultimate... Okay, ultimate, the, uh, the the ultimate, ultimate I, d- ultimate I just reward. want the one that looks like a prefix badge. The red one. Yeah, I read yeah, on yeah. Your... yeah, but no, but you see, the thing is that I reckon that the 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 more exclusive model will be the black pill. <gasps> oh yeah, obviously black I mean, enamel. That, that's that's Hitchens level. Um, yeah, it would go with all sorts of uh, you know all sorts of suits, dinner wear, things like that. It would. Um, but I read on your website that it's made by elves. Did you? Did you? Are these? Uh, they are made by elves using Anglo-Saxon filigree, um, sort of uh, enamel work, and and. Yeah, and and it's made out of material which is suspiciously like gold. Gold is that what it was, <laughs> or looks a little bit like gold? It is gold. It is gold. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. That's why they're so expensive. Uh, yeah, I was so cheap actually. But I cheap don't, at the price. I don't have to pay for mine though, do I? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I'm in the club now. Everyone who goes <laughs> on the podcast, every every yeah. uh, you, you automatically become a special friend. <gasps> oh my gosh, that's so fabulous, so. That's yeah. why it was so upsetting when Douglas rejected his badge, <sighs> saying I don't like badges. Um, I mean, I think I, maybe I. Utterly missing, missing uh, whatever the point is. What was is. the question you were going to ask me? You were going to you were going to tell me about about Roy Strong. Yes, um, I. I think so. Well, yeah, because mm. I, I quite like that. Like the way that the story about how you got your job at Channel Four. Yeah, and it, it, this is the same about Roy Strong. Tell yeah, I'm did. quite. I'm quite sort of. What would you say is the word? Pushy. Not pushy. Yeah, I, I'm. I've always been quite confident. I suppose confident. Yeah, so um, Roy Strong was on television, I remember, as a child, and he brought out of his pocket a small miniature of Elizabeth I by Isaac Oliver, and he said, this is Elizabeth I by Isaac Oliver, Um, or it might have been Nicholas Hilliard, and I thought, what an amazing way of demonstrating that a miniature is a miniature by bringing it out of your uh, suit pocket. So he doesn't normally carry it in his suit pocket? No, I think it was probably in the collection of the Victorian (laughs) Albert Museum. Would be quite cool though, wouldn't yeah. it? Wandering around with a sort of Hilliard miniature Would you? of um Yeah. In fact, for her eightieth birthday, Roy commissioned um a miniature on vellum by me of um Antonia Fraser, who's an amazing historian, written all these books about um uh Mary Queen of Scots. So I did make a miniature of her and he gave it to her for for eightieth. So that's quite a nice sort of round robin, you know, it's sort Lovely. of Lovely. Yeah. But so I met him because he'd written an article in Country Life magazine or oh, nineteen 19- 94 something like that saying I've just finished pleaching the limes in the Elizabeth Tudor Avenue and it's worthy of the brush of one of those 17th century artists who painted aerial views of country estates so I thought this is my you thought, I, I. that's me <laughs> so I immediately went to my uh, word processor and uh, typed this letter which said I am destined to paint your garden I didn't ask him I just said I am destined to paint your garden and sent him a few postcards of paintings I'd done 
and he I, I have all of these postcards that we sent back and forth and I said and he said how much on one postcard I wrote back with the price and he said it's a deal and then he said come I think it was my 24th birthday party birthday and I went up to the Lasket in Herefordshire and um, I was very intimidated because you, you know he was you know very famous art uh, art historian and the director of the National Portrait Gallery when he was 31 and the Victorian Albert Museum until about 1986 so he was a very important figure in the cultural life in of our country really 1780s and 80s and um, so we we had quite a formal dinner lunch with him and his wife Julia Trevelyan Oman who was a th- opera uh, designer for the Royal Opera House and I remember at the end of the meal I was quite surprised that he ate a banana with a knife and fork I thought I'd never seen that before mm. so I, I picked an apple I thought that it looked a bit complicated um, anyway I did <laughs> I did the painting and um, and it worked out really well it had all the cats in the painting I can remember the name one was called the Reverend Wenceslas Muff one was called Larkin one was called Susie and they're all buried in the garden uh, now but they they appear in this sort of map that I painted of the garden, and he used it as the fly leaves of his diaries, which came out what 1986, something like that. And he's used it in quite a number of books, including one from Yale University Press called *The Artist and the Garden*, which starts off with a anecdote about commissioning me to do the painting. He said, "When I was 60, I was writing for *Country Life*, and a letter arrived from a 26-year-old young man who announced that he was destined to paint the garden. And taking a leap of faith in the young, we commissioned it for my birthday." And he said it was commissioning that painting which led him to write the book. Um, asking the question, who are the other people and why are the other people throughout history commissioned paintings of their gardens and estates, which was fantastic because it put me in this academic uh, position as as a painter of country. Well, it put, you, it put you in the pantheon of, 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 yeah, of artists. Yeah, so of course I double my prices. Do, actually, <laughs> can I ask you, I, you don't necessarily have to, ne- have to name the price, but how did you know what price to quote? Well, I was very careful. I, I initially, I remember that a friend in Scotland, his mother used to go to Agnews every year and bought a watercolor by a re, you know a nineteenth century artist. Um, you could get them for about two thousand pounds back then, a little Cotman sketch, and she was building up a collection. So I thought, well, if that's her budget, two thousand a year for you know, and I'm not well known at all, but you know, I'll I'll charge two thousand and four hundred for the frame. So it was a loss leader, basically. Yeah, cause, just cause, to get the commissions yeah. out there. Yeah. Fantastic. And then it it grew and grew and grew over 30 years. And how long does it take you to do one of these pictures? Sometimes up to a year. Oh, so, good God. Yeah, because I, I like to see the garden at different times of the year anyway. Uh, you know, you can see the structure better in the winter, and then you see all of the flowers and the foliage colours in the summer. So I, I sometimes do things, you know, overlapping pictures. But they're, they're, they're big paintings, they're eight by six. The last two I've done have been eight by six feet, um, which is what, three metres? And the next one I'm doing is three metres. I think we prefer to keep it in feet and inches, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, we'll yeah, be imperial. It's yes. not even newfangled. I don't nonsense. know what these centimetres are, do you? But do you know that, that um, even even the Europeans used to use used to use feet? Did they? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was Napoleon who brought in oh, this yes. kind of metric, metric That's shit. Right. Um, also in America, that was easy because everything's done in feet and inches in America, which surprised me. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, oh, Roy Strong, going Roy back to Roy Strong. Yeah. So yes, we became really great friends. Uh, his after his wife died, especially he sort of re he was reborn and sort of became more theatrical. I think she liked him to be seen only with academics, and he started to spend more time with his um, his friends who were artists and 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 actors. And initially, I just used to see him a couple of times a year for his birthday party up in Herefordshire, and maybe once in London. And then in 2008, he said, oh, I'm, I'm wondering how I'm going to pay the gardeners, you know, during the, the financial crash. I said, well, this, the sensible thing is to open the garden to the public. And he said, oh, no, Julia wouldn't have liked that. I said, well, you know, she's been gone for 12 years. You know. um, and over a couple of weeks, um, he started sending me pictures of sort of gift shops that he could order on eBay. Um, he said, you won't like it, but we can tart it up. And, um, and I designed a range of merchandise to sell there, and we worked out a garden route, and I drew a plan. 
And it ended up being a complete success. You know, it um, brought in quite a lot of money. Did it really? Oh, yeah. And then he did the audio tour. So you can go by these little posts in the garden and push in, push in a number and it'll say, this is the birthday garden planted when we were 50 years old. Or whatever. Or this, this is the Elizabeth Tudor Avenue. And at the end, you can see in the distance the Shakespeare urn. Because every part of the garden told the story of his life. So he was given the Shakespeare Prize for Literature. I can't remember the year. So he would buy an urn and say, that's the Shakespeare urn. And his friendship with Cecil Beaton was celebrated by these Beaton steps. So for, for what I do, it was, a, it was the perfect place to paint. It was a, a biographical garden. So you spent a... I mean, do you, you spend a year? Not the not there, but I, I would go and visit the clients maybe five or six times, and I would stay for two or three nights right. and sing for my supper. So I would arrive at the client's house, and they would then I would I would expect just to be doing the drawing, but very often they'll say, "Oh, we've just invited a few friends for dinner," yeah. and there'll be twelve people, and and I would tell my anecdotes and then play the piano. Um, oh, you if, play the piano as well? I do, yeah, like sort of Cole Porter, and as time goes by, all that, and I sing as well. Oh my goodness! Yeah, but I'm not going to do it now. But um, yeah, you are a bit like sort of kitchen the wood, kitchen the yeah, wood. Oh, I kind love that kind of I thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I used to because I painted Burley for Victoria Leatham back in 1996, six, 96, and her daughter Miranda lives now at Burley, and we've become great friends. So I go very regularly to stay at Burley, and um, very often she would say. Um, oh, do you want to just play a few tunes after dinner? Which I always do. And the, the last time I went, she said, I think I'm getting to know your repertoire now. <laughs> so I don't pay, play yes. very many tunes. I don't yes. Play very many tunes. But it, it, this is quite a skill set you've got, particularly um, in the circles you move in. Because I was... Uh, well, if I go blind, I can move into nightclubs, you see. <laughs> I had this experience recently where I, where I was invited on, on a grouse shoot. And once you've experienced grouse shooting... Your, your terror thereafter is, how am I going to get invited back? What am I going to do? And, and somebody <laughs> else explained to me that, that there are people who are just on the sort of country house circuit, on the sporting circuit, who, who get invitations. So one way you can do it is, is by being a very good shot, for example. Um, well, Not being a good shot? No, being a very good oh, shot. Right, okay. okay, so so there's always a, the, some of those on the shoot. Um, and some people get it from having a... a a, a massive estate uh, where they can reciprocate oh, yes, and, and, of course. And, and a title i can't shoot i haven't got a got a uh, another way is is um you know being a very very rich i don't think you know i don't think i'm going to be able to do that so you, you end up you have to appeal to them as a kind of but you're, but you're you know, way. mega famous. You I don't think I, you see. You, I'm not sure I am that famous. You I are. Think you never know. You see, everybody I speak to to about you, they say, "Oh my gosh, we love his podcast." Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I. And yeah. we really want to buy one of those friendship badges. I think they're okay. 20, fine. The twenty-five pounds, I think, aren't they? Um, <laughs> but you must have seen. Have Have you seen changes in your? Clientele over yes. the thirty. Yeah, yes, they've all gone that. mad. No, no, I'm joking. Yeah. Um, originally, they were all um, landed gentry aristocrats back in the early nineties. Yeah. But now most of them are hedge funders um, or you know people in business, um, politicians. Um, yeah, so it, it's changed. People can't afford the, the aristocracy can't afford to maintain their estates or what? No, they're basically struggling to afford to replace the lead on the roofs because I mean you constant restoration battle um, but a lot of them are you know opening wedding venues that's quite a lucrative way of supplementing the income the estates that don't have a lot of farms and property to lease out ten, have tended to focus on weddings you know transforming part of the house into a wedding venue yeah which is fun because they bring it brings in all sorts of different people who appreciate the place and there's a sense of celebration i think i think it's probably a good thing more people are celebrating in these places again yeah yeah um i was thinking when you mentioned roy strong and you were talking about his the garden well no no when he was 31 becoming mm, where, 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 amazing where, where did he become direct the national portrait gallery. national portrait gallery now, now you see I, I I suspect, and you can you can tell me that I'm right here, that he was just about the last of a uh, an era that valued connoisseurship mm. over that, that that you look at the the people who well I don't know who runs the National Portrait Gallery now I imagine it's somebody woke because they all are, but the scholarship seems to have gone from from all yeah. these all these positions. Look at the National Trust. Yeah, Jervis 
Jackson, Jackson Stops, Stops mm. was one of your patrons, wasn't mm. he? Yeah, he was a, the chief advisor to the trust and commissioned maps of places like Stowe Landscape Gardens and Clifton. And then he said to me, <clears throat> we, want, we don't want something that looks like it's been made by the Ministry of Agriculture. We want something that's truly artistic and has a spirit of the of the period. So I took my influence from 18th century maps, early 18th century maps, and looked at engravings using a magnifying glass and replicated the, the marks, the dots and the wiggly lines in order to create um, an ing- something that looked like an engraving. And the way that I, that I drew it on an enormous scale and it was reduced down in the printing, so it looks like a period map. So that was, that was exciting for me. He, he provoked me to do that. Uh, and, um, and, and it's significantly it's something that's still used, whereas a lot of modern maps, you know, they've become ephemera, don't they? So I think it's always worth putting extra effort in to try and create something which has got a period feel. But I'm a traditionalist. So. But, but there, there you have it, that, that he, somebody with, with taste and connoisseurship approached an artist who was good Mm. And created something of beauty. I don't know Whereas how he found now you. they'd mm. be worried about whether whether um, whether the house was involved with the slave trade, yeah. and and they'd be wondering how they could shut it to the public lest they be exposed to this yeah. this legacy. Well, we've all had that experience, haven't we? Going into our favourite national trust property only to see photographs of you know TV personalities and state you know quotes underneath them, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I spent my early life you know, rushing around all of these country houses. I'm glad I saw them all then, before they were tainted by this overlay of, of uh, identity politics. Yeah, yeah. Which nobody, nobody likes. And as Douglas Murray said on your last podcast, one of your recent ones, you know, we're all sick of it. <laughs> We've all had we, enough. We well, don't. We want are, it and yet it still goes on. <laughs> I know. That's the but there is thing. there is a reaction against it. I mean. But how? But how would you detoxify an institution like, like the National Trust? And it seems to me that once it's been converged, SJW converged, as Fox Day puts it. Yeah. It's how do you? It's like once an apple's been eaten by worms. How mm. do you? How does it become a, a tasty know. apple again? That's a big question. I'm not. I've never been a director of a large organisation, but I would imagine hitting them where it hurts. You know, if the money's not come, if the if the subscriptions and the membership's going down, of course they have to start thinking about what the members actually want, which is go back to the original remit, which is the preservation of um, properties um, which are of a great artistic value. You know, there was there was there was nothing more to it than that. Really, there were properties that after the Second World War, were impossible to maintain and run because of the scale of them. And so people like James Lees Milne got in his bike and went round and talked to all of the owners of these properties and sort of persuaded them that if they were allowed to keep a small apartment within the building, you know, could they give it to the National Trust? So, um, I mean, bearing that in mind, it isn't really for the current management of the National Trust to start changing the remit. And I would say misrepresenting the original owners, you know, there was that whole sort of, I thought it was a bit scandalous. Um, over the last couple of years, they had sort of um, gay themes. So they would present Sissinghurst Gardens as, um, you know, the product of a gay and lesbian couple. Well, that's never the way they would have thought of themselves at the time, is it? I mean, they were, they were a product of their period. Vita Sackville uh, West and... Yeah, Harold, Harold Nicholson, Nicholson yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that that's, it's doing an enormous disservice to the memory of the people who created the places that the organization survives from. Yeah. But, um, I mean, Roy Strong was an a, a important part of re- rescuing the English country house. I think there was an exhibition that he organized with John Harris in 1979 called The Destruction of the English Country House, simply because so many uh, properties were being destroyed, you know, post-war. And um, that was another reason that I wanted to, to spend time with him, because he, for me, he was somebody who conserved and preserved the heritage of the country yeah so i know i'm just i'm just i'm just staring at the um I'm rambling on too no, no 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 you're not you don't you, you stop that the reason i'm just looking mm. is it recording me uh, yeah it? i'm just i'm just terrified that, that that we get a repeat of the julie hartley brewer where thing. you get back and you can't hear it well yeah it was just just it, it was complete the, the files were corrupt and i don't think i still don't think it was my fault i think some some glitch happened but I, I didn't record a backup so that so that if 
you know, it'd be awful. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not going to happen. Do you want to check it? Do you want to see? No, I, I don't know how to check it. You, you, you talk to me like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't. Stop that. Yeah, yeah oh, I, like I'm going to check. What, what would I do? <laughs> I, do you know what? I don't even know how to do playback on this thing. I just, I just, I've just mastered the skills <laughs> necessary to transfer the files onto a computer so I can send them to oh. my sound man. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, yeah. No, so I'm, we won't know. You, you could. No, I mean, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I think. You know, what do you think, Richard? I think it'll all be all right, but yeah. you're still haunted by that one incident, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm haunted by that one, one incident. Um, we've got also to talk about your other great patron, oh, Charlie you, Boy. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I signed a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not really sure. Oh, okay. Should, but oh. Um, no, I did. I did a, a map of Highgrove for the Prince of Wales. I actually thought it was one of my friends phoning up with a joke I was I was living in uh, Wyndham Place in London and somebody phoned up and said oh would you be able to come to Highgrove and make a plan of the garden for the Prince of Wales and I said and I thought it was a friend and I said yes that would be f-, you know I, I, I reined myself in but then when he asked for my the registration number of my car I thought oh gosh this may be serious so they said well you come at one o'clock next Thursday the Prince likes to meet fellow artists so I thought, this is fantastic. So I drove up from London in my new Range Rover, which I think I actually bought for the purpose, which is a very extravagant thing to do. But I thought, well, I have to turn up in a nice dark blue Range Rover. And um, um, he was waiting for me at the gate. I thought, Goodness me, this is amazing. And um, I walked up and he said, I'm your greatest fan. I said, goodness me, I'm your greatest fan too. He said, should we have a walk around the garden? So it's one o'clock and I thought, I'm actually starving. I'm really hungry. Yeah. Um, but what do you do? I just thought, well, I'll just have to cope, you know. So we walked around the garden for three hours. God. And um, by the time we got to the kitchen garden, I was wondering whether you could eat crab apples. Um, <laughs> and um, so we, he was very, very entertaining. And he said, oh, um, this is a beautiful tree. I said, it's a catalpa, isn't it? He said, yes, it's a catalpa. He said, it was given to me by a man, a pop star. You might have heard of him. He's called Elton John. I said, I have heard of him. <laughs> yes. So uh, we carried on. And uh, then we, we uh, came to an area of lawn where there were some sort of little piles of soil, um, which were obviously molehills. He said, can you, uh, can you put those in the picture? I said, uh, yes, yes. He said, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you make them a little bit smaller? I said, well, um, I could. They may not be visible on the map. He goes, it's a joke. <laughs> so... Uh, but he took a great deal of interest in the map and um, at the end said something like, uh, well, you should really should have an award for this. Well, I'm still waiting. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very elaborate map with box views in this sort of 18th century style again. And it's been used on tea towels in different colorways, which are hanging on argas all around the country. I, I um, imagine if you if, if you had a percentage of the merchandising, you'd have you'd have made a pretty penny from that. Oh uh, no, I'm not worried. I mean, they did pay me very well for the for the map, and then they wrapped it around a book about the garden. Um, I forget what the title is, but it, it was a it was a heavy leather book. It's over there, and they used the map on the on the flight on the the box that goes around it. What's it called? The sl- the slip leaf. Um, so I really, that was 2009, I really felt as though I'd achieved what I'd set out to do, which was to gain recognition for my art. Um, so wh- whatever else comes after that is just a, is a boon, really. Yeah. You, you haven't really, you didn't really tell us what it was like doing Oprah's Garden, because I mean, that must have been... Mm, I don't know. Um, it was an unusual experience. It's, a, it's an enormous property, which she took on and renovated. It was, I think, built in the 1920s. Um, and it has seven satellite properties around it, each with their own uh, tennis courts and gardens, whatever. It's vast, vast. Are those for her mates or what? what yeah, she... yeah, for her girlfriends to come, you know, from all the, all the clan. Because she's worth, I mean, is she, is she a billionaire? Oh, yeah. Mm. I think... No, I can't tell you. Know, she spent quite a lot, a lot of money renovating it. And at the time, it was a guy called Anthony Brown, who was the interior di- designer. And then she brought on somebody else, I think, called Nate Berkus. So it was, it was a transition time. So I painted it from, from the air. And there's a large um, lake at the back with a spout of water. So I made it look a little bit like, um, like the White House. <laughs> How, when you say you do it from the air, do, do, do you go up in the helicopter? I room? astrally project. Do you- I do. 
I have a mint tea and I sit and cross legged on. No, um, well, I have actually just re- recently bought a drone. Right. Uh, I've lost two of them. One is stuck in a tree at Roy Strong's garden, and the other one was blown out to sea off the coast of Scarborough. So they 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 sound good, but unless you've got good weather, you have to be quite and careful. You, and and I imagine you need sort of skills as well to fly the buggers. Yeah, no, I've mastered that. But the thing is, aerial photographs don't look artistic. So the trees that are in the foreground are enormous, and the things that you want to see are, you know, photographic perspective is not what I'm after. And if someone says my painting looks like a photograph, I'm, you know, you failed. Yeah, I get really upset and go red in the face. Right. But okay. um, so they're not supposed to look like photographs. I want them to look almost like those Chinese um, scroll paintings where you see everything from one particular angle. Right. I manipulate space and time because I want to. I want them really to be memory images. You know, the, an image of your memory of the place, not a literal representation of something. Yeah. It's something you can only do with with a painting or a drawing, not with a camera. Do you have a favorite house that you've that i've painted yeah it would have to be burley house because it's the biggest but it's also it still has the atmosphere of a family home because the family still live there so so presumably it was was it built by cecil lord burley Mm. queen elizabeth's what was he i mean he was secretary secretary elizabeth the first yeah so it was designed in the 1580s and i think most of the masonry was cut in in flanders and and boat you know shipped over but it, it's, it's an amazing property. It, was, um, it stands in an enormous park by Capability Brown, and it has the best collection of Italian art outside Italy, which was all Does bought, it really? yeah, bought in the 1680s when the, you know, uh, what would you call Exeter, Marcus of Exeter, uh, went on his grand tour and came back with a lot of Italian art. So all the interiors were then made Baroque in the 1680s. So it's different from the outside. The outside remains as it looked in the 1580s. But how amazing that they've managed to preserve it for all that time. I mean, they, must be, mm. they must be quite canny. In fact, they are. They're, aren't they famously canny? The... Well, I mean, it's a, it's a family that had uh, two, I think, two prime ministers in the history and also the, the Miranda's grand, grandfather was the chap who the Chariots of Fire movie was based upon. You know, he run, he ran, did he run the Minute Mile or...? Do you know the Chariots of yes. Fire movie? Yes, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. when he yeah. trains over the hurdles over the champagne glasses or something. Yeah, and they film part of that there, I think. Right, I yes, think. No, that, that, would, make, that um, would make sense. But when I first went there, again, it was a, a phone call out of the blue. No, it wasn't. I wrote to them and said, I would like to paint Burley. <laughs> and a year later, I had a phone call from Simon Leatham. Um, this was in the 90s. And uh, saying, would you like to come and paint the house? Because we don't have any really big, serious paintings of the, of the house. So I said, yes, come, come at one o'clock. Um, I expected we were going to have a sort of baked potato in the back kitchen, but we had sort of quite a, a grand uh, dinner. That Back in those days, there were still footmen who stood by the doors. So all the silver was out, and there was a fantastic tapestry, Mortlake tapestry in the dining room full of parrots and gilded blackamoors at either end of the table. I mean, really, really lush. I'm waving my hands around rather a lot, aren't I? I'm, I'm describing these yeah. parrots on the Mortlake Tatras. Um, and, uh, and then we went for a drive around the park, and I remember him grabbing some, um, um, some foliage from outside the, the door. I think it was Philadelphus. It had this beautiful smell. And I stuck it into my journal, and I still have it from this first trip. Philadelphus grabbed from the bush. So I did a series, I think, of three paintings of the property from the air, Elevated Views. That, that look as though they were perhaps painted in the 17th century. And they're so accurate. The drawing, I spent a week on the roof surveying all the chimneys. And the, the guys on the roof who are replacing the lead do it in a series of five years. They keep constantly going around. And they use my plans uh, of the roof because I drew it so accurately, apparently. So oh, John, fantastic. John Culverhouse, who's the curator, has, has this drawing on the wall in the estate office. Fantastic. So, yeah, obsessive. Quite tough on the eyes, but, yeah, obsessive. Do you have any, you, you, you must be in a perfect position to give tips on how to behave at, <laughs> how to get on, how to, how to not stick out like a sore thumb or whatever, make a dick of yourself at great country houses. Let me think, and, don't answer the phone if it rings. Yeah. I once did that, not a good idea. That was a long time ago. Um, oh gosh, what, what else would I say? Uh, don't talk business at breakfast. That's another one. Right. Um, what else can I say? Um, 
Oh, well, people in those positions appreciate discretion. So never do a podcast and talk about them. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've been perfect so far, yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> I think just be yourself. I mean, I can't imagine many other people having a career quite like mine because most of the time if you make things for a, for a family, you wouldn't go and stay with them. So what I've fallen into almost is this very antiquated way of dealing with a client so in the 18th century for instance lord burlington who was trying to bring classicism back to britain would take uh, william kent his friend off on his grand tour and then he would go and live at uh, where was it they, they lived burlington lord burlington um, and he would design furniture um, uh, paintings architecture and so he became almost part of the family which is which I think is a really interesting. There's a symb symbiosis, symbiosis going on between the client and the and the artist, and that's something that I don't think happens very often these days. Yes, you, you would be at several notches above even the head of the household staff, wouldn't you? You'd be more more like a member of the family than a than one of the servants. What when I go to stay? Yeah. Yeah, I get I get the grand bedrooms that's, and the four poster beds. Oh yeah. my god, you've had a good I life. Get, I get my my bed turned down in the evening and I even had a bottle of champagne and all today's newspapers on the bath rack at my latest client's house, which was with a little lit, lit candle. I thought that was really gilding the lily. It was fantastic though. It is kind of addictive that, that whole world, isn't it? When you realize that, that, that <laughs> there is this world out there beyond the ken of it's normal lovely. folk. It's lovely. Well, it's, it takes the pressure off me having a lovely country house. I can just stay in, stay in other people's. <laughs> This is this is what I was I was saying to to a, a friend who was staying at this, this this we were staying in a castle. Yeah. And I said, you know, I said when I grow up, I want to. I, I said, don't you worry that that we're running out of time to acquire one of these places. <laughs> that, that, that we're, I don't know how we're going to make our fortune. He said, no, no, you don't understand. You don't understand that that you don't need to own one of these things. It's a headache. Yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. To, you just need to. Which is when the conversation cropped up about like. What skill set can you bring to the party? Mm, but I can't mm. play the. I can't sing Cole Porter. Mm, um, I can teach you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I think you should record a new ident for your um, podcast. No, do you know what? I think actually. It's the darling part. I think the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Sit back and relax. <laughs> God, actually, yeah, you could do that. That, that. that that might help, Jonathan. It might. Time for a cup of tea. Time to donate <laughs> to the Patreon or subscribe star. Yeah, just check the website. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, <laughs> actually, because that would be a good way to, instead of sounding like a kind of naked, naked begging moment. I never pictured you naked and begging. <laughs> If we had your, had your voice saying something gently, <laughs> gently suggestive. Like, yeah, well, go, you'd how, have how, to be a special friend to get that. Well, how would you, how would you do it? How would you, how would you, I'd say, turn over, darling. You, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah that's true. What, how, what? Uh, what, is the, what is the way of, of, of getting people to give you money without them feeling like you're importuning them? Well, I think for you, people love being part of this uh, community, don't they? Yeah. I think that's what everybody wants. They want a sense of belonging with groups of people that they have their, they chime with. Do, do you know what? I think I am like a living English country house. Are you? Well, maybe, maybe. You, a bit you, leaky, a bit you damp. Come, no, no, stop that. <laughs> I'm, one of, I'm one of the ones that belongs to a family which has got... got <laughs> Shed loads of money, yeah. and they because because the good ones you see when you stay the, the crap ones. Not that I said many crap ones. I mean, I, I sound like I've taken them a lot. <laughs> but have you noticed how actually the, the 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 sort of fittings and 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 the they haven't got rotting window frames, for example, and and actually the the carpets are quite new and quite clean. Yeah, they're they're Is quite. This how you see yourself. <laughs> well, I was just trying to. I was just trying to counter your suggestion that I was full of mold and, and no. whatever. Oh right, no. and, and and also, I, I my baths have have like they're huge. Those huge ones with oh yes, those interesting oh yes. Well, you push have. your feet against them and you drift to the other end. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But I see you more of a guru than as a country house. What a Maharishi kind of. Yeah, thing. that sort of thing. I think you should maybe have some Nero shirts made. I'd then look like Willie Hamilton, uh, Dalrymple, wouldn't I? Who? Well, Willie Dalrymple, he's gone. He's gone native. Has he? Oh, right. Oh, God, okay. Totally native. 
No, I think people just like you as you are. When we were in the kitchen earlier, I was looking at your... What what fabric is that that your beautiful jacket is made of? Oh, um, Keeper's Tweed. Keeper's Tweed. And I can reveal that it was... Da- who darned the, the, the arm? Because it was beautifully it was darned. A, it was a cat. A cat did it? Yeah. So it's not darning, it's just it's a, cat. a hole. Cat, okay. cat. Well, cat, I love cat, that. Cat, I love cat that. hole. Yeah, I don't know. You see, I'm not sure whether cats are a... Cats are a bit kind of SJW, aren't they? Are they? Oh, the blue ones are. Our cat, our, actually... Oh, I've got to tell you about what happened outside. Oh, tell me, yeah. What, yeah, what? well, so we haven't mentioned that we're, we're sitting in a my gracious apartments in the Royal Crescent in Bath. Yes, I'm actually... This is unusual. I've actually... I, I was so keen to do you. Um, really? That, yep. You shouldn't I'm, say that in public. <laughs> I was, oh, no, I, John, I, I have. I've, I've been looking across at you and thinking how... Yeah. No. I... Um, Drove down to to Bath. Yes. Um, which is kind of Jane Austen, Jane Austen country, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Jane Austen Well, I mean, she country. came late. It was a Georgian city, and then she came in, what's 1800, 1810. It's a beautiful place. I mean, the architecture is stunning, as you can see. Mm. The Royal Crescent is, a, it's a bit like living in a monument, though, I must say. People stand outside and take photographs of the building all day. And, and we were looking at my jacket earlier. It's a Welsh Guardsman's jacket. And occasionally I put that on and sort of put some flour on my face so that they can take a photograph of the facade and then later say, oh, look, there's a ghost in the window. So I do that. But, but they do. Well. But it's a really fun place to live because sometimes I'll see protest groups coming out and standing along the, the ha-ha. There's a ha-ha here, ha-ha here, at the end of the private part of the garden. And one day I saw this enormous group of 20 protesters from, um, um, what's it called? Extinction, Re- yeah, Extinction Rebellion. I could see their sort of uh, putrid green flag and I thought, ooh, goody. <laughs> so I rushed outside with my phone switched to video and I thought I'd speak to them all one by one, which took a while because they were socially distanced by about 25 feet and they were all wearing masks in the broad sunlight and the sunshine. And I, I walked up to the first one. I said, hello, have you met the Doom Goblin? And she said, what? I said, the Doom Goblin, Greta Thunberg. No, no humour at all. So I went to the next one. Have you met the Doom Goblin? <laughs> no, here's the Doom Goblin. I said, Greta Thunberg. I said, she's a bit of an evangelist. You know, she's a bit of a catastrophist, isn't it? A bit apocalyptic. And of course, she probably, I think she speaks truth to power. I thought, oh, great. <laughs> Next cliche, please. So the next guy. Oh, apparently they, they, they'd all had they all had bikes. They'd all arrived from Bristol on bikes with flasks of fair trade coffee with soy milk. Yeah. And uh, so the next one, I went to. I said, "You want to stop me travelling, don't you?" He said, "No, only frequent flyers." I said, "Well, I'm a frequent flyer. I loved going to Rome all the time." He said, "Well, there are other ways of getting there." And I said, "What on a Segway, a donkey?" He said. You could walk. I said, Why, how long would it take to walk to Rome? Anyway, so I was just being a bit provocative, but I think I was doing it in quite a professional way because the, the leader of the gang said, which organisation do you work for? I said, I'm, I'm just me. I live over there. I live in the one in the middle. So, um, so it is quite amusing. Is that very have, naughty have of you, me to have you Have you kept the video? Yeah, I, st- I think I've still got it on my phone. Should, should I hope you stick it, it up on, on the internet? Yeah, if it's still on my phone. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's unlikely. Sake. Yeah, it's really. Gold. Really, but they did, the problem was they didn't have anything to say because I said you want to bring in carbon taxes, don't you? And they said they admitted it was really what they were after. So, um, no, and, and then we've had all sorts of different uh, protest groups arrive, uh, and also a lot of filming. So you never know what you're going to see out the window. Honestly, I woke up one morning and I opened the shutters, and there was this enormous hot air balloon, literally sort of fifty feet from the window. And that was for a BBC film. And the week before, we had Lily James here filming uh, Nancy Mitford drama, which was much more my scene. Lots of lovely sort of vintage cars. Um, well, we so like Lily James, or at least we do. I mean, I, I just like looking at she's her. She's gorgeous. But I don't know whether... I, I imagine her politics are as woke as any... Well, novice. she's an actress. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I was thinking, oh. you, you, you're an artist. Mm. You must be just about the only artist with your Yeah, poli- somebody politics. said that in London the other day. It's pretty unusual to have. Um, well, my co- my politics is complex now because, you know, I've spent all this time complaining about wokeism in the left, but now we have Conservative Party, which I don't I don't really agree with the policies, with the lockdown policies. No. No, so I don't know what I am. They've, they've united the country 
in 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 hatred misery. And, 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 dis- and and misery in yeah misery and epoxia is it called epoxia richard hypoxia it, what's it what does it mean when you when you have hypoxia it, 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 it's um oxygen starvation from breathing in your own co2 and a rather wonderful <laughs> reason for giving for the condition that prevents you from wearing a mask yeah i can't wear one hypoxia yeah oh dick <laughs> that is even better than i'm mask exempt that's just like no um, hat tip to andy from for the third wednesday group for that Hypoxia. That's the excuse. I just say I'm exempt and it doesn't go any further. It, it normally doesn't. No. Because you almost want to volunteer. <laughs> I proxied. I know. I'm just <laughs> thinking that actually the, the, I, I was slightly ashamed of myself when I went up north recently. Although I did it in some of the places like the service station. I didn't do it in all the places. I didn't do that. I'm mask exempt. Cause I, I, I thought it's the north and they're trying to run a business. And But actually I mm. should have done because they were they were they, they, they're really eager to for an excuse for a bit of norm- normality yes and uh, you you represent normality yeah, yeah. well <laughs> i do you know it's 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 like um it, it, it's the sign that of end times when the lunatics are the same yes oh and yeah i think Absolutely. we are we are the same ones yeah hang on can I get this straight you were in the north <laughs> and they're locking down the north now yeah yeah are the two things perhaps related have you remembered it? Have you I, infected I was, them? I was, no, I was the Durham super spreader. No, weren't you? I, I, and I did my best. And That sounds like man-spreading. What I don't understand is this, if I was the Durham super spreader in, in February and only now they're locking down Durham, that suggests to me that I didn't do a very good job or that maybe there's a lot of people who are um, asymptomatic Yes. Well, there are very different. There are lots of different types of this virus, as we know. Yeah. It, it can be more or less anything, actually. Yeah, it can, <laughs> inclu- including last year's cold bug. Yeah. 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 Well, um, yeah. I've never actually worn a mask. Well, you no. Know, well, obviously, you've got you get hypoxia. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, yeah. Yeah. I do. I get a bit short of breath. Do, but... do, do you, um, your circle of, well, what is your circle of, of, of I don't have one. I'm no. a total hermit. Are you? Yeah. Oh, so I'm quite. I'm quite lucky to get get this exclusive access. Yeah. To you. You are only the third person to come into this apartment since March. That's yeah. yeah. You are. You're. Yeah. Do you, Do you remember that term, Barty? We. <laughs> we Who's that? Oh, you missed that. You obviously just missed that. There was a. There was a. There was a well-meaning. There was a well. The typical sort of Reverend J.C. Flannel kind of uh, chaplain. And he was trying to give a, give a sermon one day on on or talk a talk to the boys on how not to bully other boys because bully, <laughs> bullying is bad apparently, and so he told this sort of parable about this boy whose name was Barty and Barty got Barty got bullied, and instantly thereafter, if you wanted to to ruin somebody's life, you would just call them Barty and tease them <laughs> mercilessly. And I just thought this is just a fantastic example of why sort of well-meaning... It's the same as the Joey Deacon thing. The, yeah, I mean, the, the, when Joey Deacon was uh, featured on, I think, Blue Peter, wasn't it? He, he was, um, whatever it was that was wrong, it was severely mentally disabled older boy. And... Um, Joey just became the standard school ground insult. It completely failed to do what it was intended to do. It's the law of unintended consequences, isn't it? But Barty was our, our very own Malvern College term for a friendless individual. Oh, no. And I didn't mean that. I mean, I am a herbit, but I do... I go into... St- <laughs> no! You're not I'm a Barty. actually quite popular. No, I do... I've been going popular. to... Popular. I've been getting in my um, 17-year-old... Um, uh, Toyota Land Cruiser, which I call Melania, and I, I think you about to say seventeen-year-old toy boy. <laughs> no, no, that's Sorry. not legal. No, um, no, I trundle off in this in much the same way as you ha- you wear a jacket with lots of sort of cat uh, darnings on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I drive this rather rusty old Jeep type of. Oh, you've thing. got rid of the Land Rover, uh, the, the Range the Rover. Oh, yeah, that, the, that the, went the many blue, many years blue ago. Blue Range Rover. Yeah, that was far too clean and nice. It had little blue lights in it. And, no, this is something I can throw nine foot lengths of wood inside because I make my own picture frames as well yeah and then um, it, it, it doesn't matter it, I think there's something quite nice about having well it has wood effect inside which I love oh I like I like that yeah it that feels like you're driving school. a sofa no that, that, that's good <laughs> how many how many commissions do you do a year um, it depends how I'm feeling um, 
But uh, the most I've done is five in a year. And recently, because they've become bigger and bigger, um, about two. So, but I've done 90 altogether. And do, I mean, do you have a, do you have a, a, a good lifestyle? I think so. I mean, I can do everything that I want to do. I travel. I love Italy, so I go to Italy as often as I can. I mean, I think, yes, I feel as though I'm the luckiest man alive because I get to do what I want. I'm not particularly materialistic. You know, I, I don't yearn for anything in particular. Um, I feel very content. Yes. Yeah. And also I've learned from, this is something you said earlier, it's an enormous millstone to have one of these big country houses. And um, a few friends have said to me, Say, I remember Lord Bernard at Bernard at um, uh, what's it called, the castle up in Northumberland, Raby Castle. Raby castle. Yeah, he said you're the luckiest man alive. He said, you know, imagine the responsibility of taking on. It's not just the the building; it's the estate as well, the maintenance, and you're basically looking after a whole community of people who look to you for you know renovating their properties and things like that. So I, do, I wouldn't want to be doing all that. I mean, no. that's why I didn't have children. Yes. That that's why, we... by the way, I'm 51, but look 36. Very good. It's, it's the elixir. It's a sacred elixir of being childless. Um, can we, can we talk? Dick was Dick's uncomfortable about this. And that's it. That, believe it or not, is the sudden and unexpected end to my I think you'll agree <laughs> brilliantly enjoyable podcast with the fantastic adorable Jonathan Miles Lee now if I were to tell you why why it came to a sudden end you wouldn't believe me if I told you it is the most extraordinary story and maybe maybe Jonathan will talk about it another time or maybe he'll he'll, he'll never feel like it but it is just um <laughs> yeah Amazing. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed the podcast and please remember to support me on Patreon or on Subscribestar. Things are getting getting really serious right now. I think I think you'll agree that that <laughs> call it what you will, call it the, the big tech, the deep state, whatever. The system is working harder and harder to suppress voices like mine and the voices of the kind of people that I want to have on the podcast. I'm going to become more and more isolated and I need your help. I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and um, see you next week.